In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Today's the second month, the 25th day of the year 2024, and the second Lord's Day in Lent. What's the Lord? Let us speak. Oh, which the Lord has made. Which the Lord has made. Let, Let us be glad, glad and rejoice therein. You know, St. Paul, not only go to jail, he was beat up. Yeah, yeah. They beat him up a lot. You know, like... Killed him. In my younger days, I was a good fighter. Even now, I could fight good for about two or three minutes, but my lungs are... Yeah. After that, I'm done. My lungs are out, unless God helps me. Yeah. So, I, I might get a couple beatings. You, We all might get a couple beatings. He might get... I mean, so St. Paul was beaten. He, I think he died that one time. Everybody said they surrounded him. And it was as if he was dead. And God rose him from the dead. So, and he went to jail. Huh, how many times? Had to escape down a wall with a basket. So, okay. But in jail, if you read what happens in jail, he converted a lot of your uh, jail guards yeah. that were in there. And he, he got to preach. Peter went to jail. So, yeah. you know, yeah. one day you might see me come up here with a black eye. And <laughs> <laughs> they can't break any more of my teeth up here, but I only got a few under here. Knife sticking out of your back. You know. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Brother Richard. Yeah. Brother Richard. Yeah. I just saw, uh, uh, I just saw a little bit of the... Shooting video, it was amazing. Such oh. a beautiful moment. I wish I was, yeah. I was there with you guys. I, I, you <laughs> Such know, a Catholic moment. It was. It was a Catholic warrior moment. I got it from Alex to look at, too, yeah. so if you can't tell. I got, I got a couple I of know. Them you. Uh, it's a Catholic warrior moment. There's only one thing I regretted. The poop wasn't up there in the See? middle. <laughs> so we can shoot at him. Yeah. Yeah. Ba-bing! Ba-bing! And I told the brothers, don't kill him right away. Yeah. You know, kneecap, yeah. kneecap, elbow, <laughs> shoulder. Then you go up and you smack them if you can. Yeah. <laughs> then you sp- spit. I think sometimes spitting in someone's face is yeah. worse than getting oh, yeah. a punch. Yeah. Really. I was, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like they did. That's like, yeah. you'd rather be punched than spit in the face. Yeah. Think about what they did to our Lord. Yeah. Now they were talking they about St. Paul. What did they do to our Lord? Yeah. What do you think about it? The spitting thing to me, I mean, it's all bad, but, but yeah. you know, that's like, ah, anyway. It's more insulting. But anyway, uh, Yes, we, we have, uh, we're not a bunch of wimps up here, all right? <laughs> Never in the history of God's chosen people were they ever called to be wimps. No. So where did they get this from? It's a modern, they think Jesus came, he's like a peacenik, you know? And he came so you know what God So That's why they don't like St. Charlemagne, yes. and St. Constantine, Theodosius, uh, Justinian the Second. Mm-hmm. Justinian, uh, he was good too. Uh, when you read the stories of these guys, I mean, Richard the Lionheart, uh, the first crusade, which was a victorious crusade. As a matter of fact, I got together a uh, the lecture I did for Alex about you know uh, Catholic uh, military guys. Now you're in the real arm, the biggest arm, most important army, the strongest army, the best army, the Catholic army. Well, I t- I got a whole bunch of clips I got together now uh, showing these Catholics fighting uh, unbelievers and killing them and slicing them up and all that. And so you're going to look at Catholics fighting, slicing, dying, stabbing, cutting heads off. Anyway, I, I, it's going to be a pretty not real long, but uh, I was going to insert it on in my lecture, but I might just have, have it like as an example of Catholic warriors, mm-hmm. you know, Catholics fighting for Christ, killing for Christ. Because, you know, I think uh, Josh posted up something on uh, uh, from the plot against the church. He had some good quotes in there mm-hmm. about the Jews who rejected Christ, but there was a heresy in it. Or it, it could be implied as a heresy. Uh, they were saying, all oh, the Jews expected Christ, to, uh, the Messiah, to be a conquering king who was going to shed blood. And so when the Messiah and Christ came and he didn't shed blood, because the Messiah doesn't, he didn't shed blood, they were scandalized and they didn't believe in him. Now, that could, that could be heretical if you don't take it the right way. The first time he came, he came not to shed blood. He came to redeem. Our souls. Mm-hmm. Because unless your soul gets right, you can't have a Catholic kingdom. Yeah. What good is it to have a... How can you have it? Yeah. Your soul is number one. So Christ came to give us everlasting life first, our souls. <clears throat> Second, he is coming to kick the shit out of people. And even not then, before that. Even during the whole new covenant era, he said, he, he, he yes, commanded his to go out there and to kill in his name. Mm-hmm. So... I know, I read that plot again. See, that's why when you... I got all these books up there. They got a lot of good stuff, but be careful. They all contain heresies. Mm -hmm. Their implication is Christ... And and you'll hear this during the New Covenant era. No no wars. Mm -hmm. We don't believe in just wars. Catholics can't kill people. Uh, You know, I didn't have corporal punishment now. Mm -hmm. So these knuckleheads in in their new catechism condemn the death penalty. Mm -hmm. They condemn just wars. 
Catholics aren't supposed to kill anybody. Where did they get that from? I don't know. So, you, so the, the thing that happened with the Jews, though, they they knew that he was going to conquer and shed blood, and that was true. So the guy made it sound like that. That wasn't. No, that is true. He is going to come and shed blood. Even the apostles were a little bit not, not sure because they figured Christ is going to start killing people. But he was telling, not that. Now, first the kingdom comes in your soul, later I come, and then, you know, as far as the second coming, that's when the Messiah comes the second time, when he does mops up all the mess and all that. But even during the New Covenant era, he has Catholic kingdoms ruling and killing people. But, so, the, 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 uh, what they didn't understand, which is to me, and he said to the apostles, one verse I like, it's in Mark 9, 29, and he said, the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after the third day, he shall rise again. And it says, and the apostles understood not the word. Mm -hmm. What don't you understand about that? It's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Son of man's going to die. They didn't think he was going to die themselves even. They thought he was going to come and bring the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Then, even his apostles. Yeah. And they were even blinded to Isaiah 53. Isaiah <laughs> 53. The son of man must come. They will kill him and he will be slain. And by his death he shall redeem. And by his bruises we are healed. Isaiah 53. The suffering Messiah. Daniel chapter 9. The, the Christ shall be slain, and after that, you, you then you have the, he's going to redeem people when he's slain. So the new old covenant was talking about the Messiah being slain. You know, a lot of these Jews too that have, still, they'll say, "Oh, he's got to he's got to die." That's why you think Shearson is going to come back again because mm -hmm. he's dead now. They, yeah, he's dead now. He's going to come back. He's going to mm -hmm. resurrect or something. But so the first coming, they say, "Wait a second, he's got to die, but he's also going to conquer." Yeah, there's two come one for the soul, second for the body. And our bodies, as St. Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 3, or one of them, the body has not yet benefited them from the redemption. St. Paul says, For we know that every creature groaneth and travaileth in pain, even till now, and not only it, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the spirit of the soul, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the sons of God, the redemption of our body. Romans chapter 8, verses 22 to 23. Our bodies are still concupiscent. We have devils in there messing with us on our bodies. They're weak. We get sick. Our bodies still have not benefited from the redemption. That's the second coming. You could be a perfect saint and great and all that, you know, and, but you got the concupiscence of the flesh. St. Paul says he had that struggle. I see that there's something in me that uh, it, it tries to make me go another way than I want to go. St. Paul talks about that. We call that the concupiscence of the flesh. See Romans chapter 7, verses 14 to 25. So, the, And I always say this a million times. How is it that you think Ben Hur shows this too? The movie Ben Hur is really great. That Ben Hur was kind of a faithful Jew, but not 100%. And he was zealous. And he got too angry at the Roman occupation. And he wanted to fight against the Romans like rebels. He was more like a nationalist. He put nation more than religion. And God allowed the Roman yoke under them to humble them to punish them for their sins, and, and, uh, and says, obey the Roman yoke. And uh, he was so zealous, he just wanted to go out and start killing people. And when you, uh, the, the whole Romans, I mean, overthrew the Romans. And when you look at it, and, and when Christ came, he's saying, wait a second. Wait a second. You want the kingdom to come, and it's not even in your heart. You're either an unfaithful Jew, or you're a bad Jew. You're not even a Jew, you're like a, a fallen away, or you're a bad Jew. You're, you're committing mortal sins. How is the kingdom going to come like that? When I got like, out of a million people, 900,000 of you guys are either falling away or you're in mortal sin. That's not the kingdom of God. Never can the kingdom of God come when you're like that. So, and what has to be done first? You have to first be pure, and that's still not even enough. Now you have to have your sins remitted too, which is what Christ, because the Old Testament, even the faithful Jew during the Old Testament, complete saint, total faithful Jew, like St. Joseph and St. Anne, their they, the original sin was still there. Their sins were covered. They weren't remitted yet. So you needed the remission too, which is what Christ did. But he's telling them, and like Ben-Hur, you want to conquer the Romans, and you're not good yourself. The Irish say, I want to get the British out of, of Ireland, um, but you're not right yourself. Why do you think he let them come in? Why do you think he let them take over Ireland and oppress them? Because he was punishing you because of your national. You put your race before the religion. You put your race above your faith. But Christ was coming and say, the soul is the most important thing. And think about it. If you don't have Catholics, how can you have a Catholic kingdom? That's all I'm saying. If you don't have faithful Jews, 
How can you have a, a, a faithful Jewish kingdom? And what did God do to all the Jews during the old covenant era when they went back? Took away their kingdom. Put them into exile. You're not worthy. Get out of here. Because what happens, there's a period of time where they have the kingdom, and they're bad, and they're given a bad name to the true God, and he only lets that last for so long, he warns them by the prophets, you better wise up, or he's going to take your kingdom away, you better wise up, he's going to put you into exile, you better wise up, he's going to destroy your temple, you better wise up, or he's going to send a pagan uh, king in here to kick your ass and take you into exile, and then if you don't, he finally has them come in, kill most of you and take you into exile. Because there's a whole period of time when you think about it, when they were really bad, where their kingdom was not even an Israelite kingdom. It wasn't faithful. Look at Rome. They still have the Vatican. They got the buildings. Is that the Catholic kingdom? It's a scandal. Or even Lord said that, uh, this is one where I said, love in Jeremiah. She says, this temple, from the day it was built, is a provocation in my eyes. This temple, from the day it was built by Solomon, is a provocation in my eyes. And then you would sit back and say, how could that be? God ordained the temple to be built. It was God Almighty that told Solomon to do it. It was ordained by God. It was meant to be holy. And at one, for a period of time, it was very holy. But they desecrated it. They ruined it. And there's nothing worse when you take God's home and you turn it into a whorehouse with idols or false gods and false teachings. And so now it makes the true God look bad, right? And this is what's happening in Rome. And God is now allowing in Rome this to happen for a very long period of time because they're worthy of this deception. This great When you go back, let me put it this way. If you go back and, and you look at the desecrations right now and you see Jupiter on there uh, raping, uh, raping Ganymede and you look at Janus with the two-headed God, you go and you look at the naked Venus in a bottle and you think that's okay, then you're worthy to be deceived for a thousand years. You deserve it for a thousand years. And you deserve it. And the only thing that is different is God is allowing it to happen. He has not destroyed them yet. Back in the Old Testament, he only let you get away with that for so long. Then he had the temple destroyed. Although, the temple did stand for quite a while before it fell, the first temple. But then they rebuilt the second one. And now, when they denied Christ, that one fell. But the whole thing is, you have to have the kingdom in your heart. That has to be the first thing. And, and I wrote about that in, in all my life. It's, it's common sense, right? I mean, how could you have Freemasons if you don't have any Freemasons? You know, or anybody. I mean, if, they don't, if you don't have anybody who really believes in it. If you don't have anybody who really has the faith. So you have, and you want to have a, a, to have a good kingdom, you have to have mostly good Catholics. You can have, even in a good Catholic kingdom, you have bad ones. But they weed them out. They do not let them stay there and rest comfortably in the Catholic Church, in Catholic lands, doing evil things without being admonished and punished. Because if you don't condemn them and you don't punish them, that's the end of the Catholic Kingdom. It's all over. Now that we had the non-judgmentalism, that's the word. It, it, it first out started non-punishmentalism. We don't punish them. Then we don't even judge them anymore. Forget punishment. Don't even judge the guy. So if you don't judge him, you don't got to punish him, right? But what happened to Eli, the high priest? Yeah. Yeah. His, sons. His two sons were bringing in whores in the temple. They were fornicating in the temple. They were stealing the tithe money and all that. Eli's two sons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Eli knew it. Yeah. And he condemned them. Yeah. So he wasn't a non-judgmentalist. But what did he do? He didn't punish them. Yeah. He, said, he says uh, in the verse, he says... Uh, there will be iniquity in your house forever, for you, you knew that your sons did wickedly, and you did not chastise them. You know that your sons did wickedly, and you did not chastise them. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 13. For I foretold unto him, Heli, that I will judge his house forever for iniquity, because he knew that his sons did wickedly, and did not chastise them. And that was it for him because he didn't punish them. It was it's crazy when you're reading because it, it's like Biden when he's talking about Israel, right? <laughs> stop killing the Gaza people. That's not right. But he doesn't punish Israel, right? I'm, uh, stop killing the Gaza people. He keeps giving them weapons. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's 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 lip service, right? Yeah. This is not right. You're just unjustly yeah. killing civilians. Keep giving them weapons. Yeah. yeah. It's bullshit. Yeah. He, he made a judgment, Connie. He said, stop. Yeah. It's humanity crisis. But he didn't do nothing about it. Yeah. It's a game they play. 
He talks to the Jew in the background, says, I got to say something to appease the people, but I'm going to keep giving you guys weapons. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Same thing. Here. And when I read that thing, I, he like, on the, I said, you, you catch it before I read that one verse I just quoted to you when God condemned him and all that. And, and I'm, I'm saying, all right, okay. You condemned your sons, then you're reading on, they're still doing it. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And I'm reading, and nothing's being done about it. I'm like, what, what is this? What is this? It's like telling your kids, you know, you know, don't do this. And then he does it, and then you say, don't do this. And he does it, and you say, don't do this. And he does it, and there's no punishments. He don't care. Do you really mean it? Either you don't mean it, or you're a wimp. Today, it's weird you got wimpiness, too. Yeah. Where they really don't want you to do it, but they can't punish you. Can't spank them. <laughs> you know, I'm going to get in trouble. You know, you know, you know, give him time out, him with the puff ball or something. They don't, even want, they don't want to punch people anymore. <laughs> That's part of the letter to the editor that we're putting in there, right? It, it's timely because in the school, the school right now in Sierra County, the kids are like hitting mm -hmm. the teachers, they're yeah. fighting and... <laughs> Bro, Alex told me. Go ahead, look at Virginia. Uh, yeah, my mom works in a high school in Charlottesville, Virginia, and uh, they closed down the school for like three days because there was like a 40 person brawl between the blacks and the Arabs. <laughs> the blacks and the Arabs had a riot in school, right? Yeah. And your mother's a teacher there. Yeah, she couldn't do yeah. nothing about it. Right? How could she? Yeah. Yeah. She could get in trouble. Right? right? Imagine that. What happened to school today? Oh, they had another riot. <laughs> yeah, that was part of our uh, curriculum. Yeah. <laughs> But it's amazing because in TRC now and the Sentinel, they're complaining about that. There's a big thing about that. And the Francis Luna did make a good statement. She says, when I go up, say, I'm going to spank the kid till his behind is hurting. Yeah. <laughs> but nowadays, you're not allowed to do anything. That's why that article, we're ready for that article yeah. Yeah. to go out there, you know. We got an infernal wimpiness amongst people. And that's why when I put in that uh, about Catholic killing people, you know. It's always been that way, you know. I mean, uh, God's chosen people have to kill people. You, know, you wouldn't think God's going to do it all himself. He does a lot of times when you, when, when you can't defend you. God does. Watch, watch Moses. That's another great one. God delivered them basically by himself until they came to the land of Canaan. And then God says, now you guys, now they're organized. He said, actually, before Canaan, even when they were in Basan, they did have some victories. King of Basan and, and uh, Shion King of the Amorites. So they had a few little minor victories. Then he wanted them to go into the Canaan and defeat the Canaan. And he says, now, now you got to fight. Yeah. Okay, you're strong enough now. you you got to fight. The desert has rotted your brain, Joshua. Yeah, yeah. Your brain, but not yeah. My heart. That was you a great scene when, when the guy says, Joshua. You're gonna look how big these people are. Oh, yeah. He says, You're gonna risk your family, your life. Yeah. Find these people. And Joshua goes, When God ordains, there is no risk. Yeah. When God leads. Yeah. He goes, When God leads, there is no risk. Yeah. Joshua and Caleb were the only two that withstood those other ten uh they went out to spy out Canaan. And so Moses spy out Canaan, find out the strengths, the weaknesses, find out how big they are. And so what are spying it out, the ten of them were all chicken shits. <laughs> and they're talking to like Joshua. <laughs> and, and he says, don't you see what God has done to us, for us, in Egypt? God, if God is with us, nobody's going to beat us. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I love that part where he's saying, has a, has a desert sun worked at your brain, yeah, Joshua? Yeah. He says, maybe my brain, but not my heart. Yeah, right. That was one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe my brain, but not my heart. Yeah. Joshua. Select twelve men, one from each of the tribes of Israel. Lead them across the plain into Canaan. Look closely at everything you see, then return with your news. Caleb, from the tribe of Judah. Samua. Davi. Shabbat. Eagle.
you tried to occupy this land. So now me. Are you too scared to lead us to the land God promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? I won't lead my family to certain death or enslavement. God will be with us. He will lead. Be reasonable, Joshua. We've spent 40 days here. 40 days. You saw the same things we saw. The cities are heavily fortified and the people are strong. And there are so many, Joshua. But what good will their numbers be against the strength of the God who delivered us from Egypt and destroyed the Pharaoh's army? Will you risk the life of your children on it, Joshua? Where the Lord leads, there is no risk. like a madman. Eating nothing but manna has destroyed your good sense. <laughs> the desert sun has rotted your brain. Perhaps, but not my heart or my faith. My trust is in the Lord. My love is for God. Can you say the same, Nabi? Yeah. Are you so righteous that you'd risk our lives? I claim no special righteousness, only devotion to the words of God. Yeah. Yeah. You've spent yeah. too long yapping at Moses' heels like a faithful lapdog. <laughs> It's no. time you thought for yourself. He does, as do I. And we know that the land God promised us lies within our reach. Try it, and the Hevites will slice your hand off. They are mighty people. And if the Lord is with us, he will bring us there. Like a lambs to slaughter. Can you doubt God? Look how far he's brought us. Martyrs were soldiers for Christ. You know, women too. Of course, women and men, kids. When God gives you the grace, go ahead. You can do what you want my body. You can't touch my soul. Yeah. That's one of the verses in Luke. Our Lord said, he says, Fear not them that can kill the body. And after that, they have nothing more that they can do. I'll show you whom you shall fear. Fear him who after he has killed hath power to cast into Gehenna. Fear him who has the power to cast your soul into hell. Don't worry about your body. Sooner, sooner or later, we all ain't got no body. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to lose our bodies. Yeah. I, told, I was telling Alex about the relics. Now, sometimes you forget, like Alex was just learning you know, on the faith and all that, and he did read the profession of faith, but there's still a lot of other things. So he wasn't quite sure about the relics and with the situation, so I explained it to him. But we take it for granted because we know, but it's good when people come in here. It's good in his case when he's fresh off the bat because he never went to the Vatican II Church. He never went to anything. So if he went to the Vatican II Church, he would have been in much more troubles trying to conflict with what he was taught. He has, he's got to sit there with them wacko priests. Yeah. And the, it, was, it was a providence of God that he didn't go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I say even when you get like a Muslim who zealous who converts an Orthodox Jew, it's easier because they have been corrupted by the uh, uh, corrupt form of, of Catholicism, nominal Catholicism. Yeah. That, look at the trouble even like even in the nominal Christians, the Protestants, we have trouble with them. Yeah. They think they have the Christian faith, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we're gathering together a little Catholic army here, you see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, however God's... But, you, of course, you always need God. You know, even when Joshua went to battle, he knew God was with him. Mm -hmm. You know, that first crusade, when they were in uh, Antioch, I think it was. I think it was Antioch, the, the castle thing there, and the crusades conquered the mob. They got inside it, and when they went inside it, they became besieged. Right, right, right. The besiegers became besieged. <laughs> but they ended up... And they were outnumbered, they, they were low on food and all that, but they found the lance of Longinus. So I got that in there, you'll see it. Yeah. And um, it gave them strength and courage and faith to get out of the siege and, and go against the Muslim, greatly outnumbered them. Right. And this was testified by, of course, the Crusaders, but the Muslims themselves. They saw a whole army of white horses and yeah. white soldiers on it, mm -hmm. marching along with them. And that was it, like, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean that was God. Yeah.
And in this desperate situation, the basic motivation of the Crusaders comes out. Their belief, the belief of the leading members, that somehow God is on their side. The Crusaders prayed for a miracle, and they got one. News spread that God had sent word to a Crusader in a vision. The Crusader was only a lowly priest from France, but his vision would inspire an entire army. He was a pilgrim by the name of Peter Bartholomew. One night, St. Andrew the Apostle appeared to him and said, Know, my son, that if you go to the church of the Blessed Peter in the city of Antioch, there you shall find the Holy Lance, the spear with which our Saviour Jesus Christ was pierced when he was hanging on the cross. And he swore that the whole story was true. The real spear that pierced Christ's side has not been seen in centuries. To find the Holy Lance now, at a time of deep crisis, would be to establish a powerful connection between the Crusaders and Christ. Peter Bartholomew handpicked his own band of 12 disciples and dashed to the small church to dig up the floor where the Holy Lance was buried. After a day and night of frantic digging, hope had begun to fail. But Peter himself leaped into the pit inside the church and pulled out a piece of rusty metal. He had found the elusive Holy Lance. This is a moment of violent religious exaltation. The mood in the army changes, aggression replaces defeatism. This is an army ready to fight. Six lines of battle were drawn up by those of us inside the city. We closed our ranks and protected by the sign of the cross, we went out by the gate. When the Turks saw our squadrons so well drawn up, coming out one after the other, they said, let them come, so that we may have them the more surely in our power. But once we were all outside, and the Turks saw how great was the force of the Franks, oh, they were much afraid. The Crusaders had just 200 horses left, but they still rode out to face the Turks head on. The Holy Lance held high. One eyewitness spoke of yet another vision army of spirits sent by God. Then appeared a countless host of men on white horses, whose banners were all white. When our men saw this, they did not understand what was happening or who these men might be, until they realized this was the blessed help sent by Christ. The Turks fled in terror, and with God's help we defeated them. The city of Antioch was once again in Christian hands. Uh, when you read the book of Maccabees, uh, that, oh Maccabees, what a great story. When you read the book of Maccabees, if that's not us today, I don't know what is. <laughs> when Judas Maccabees was going to the battle, the enemy saw he, Two angels were, were shielding off the darts that, that were coming at him, and they were shooting some darts at his enemies, left and right. So when God's with you. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm reading from 2 Maccabees, chapter 11, verses 6 to 11. But when Maccabeus and they that were with him understood that the strongholds were besieged, 
They and all the people besought the Lord with lamentations and tears that he would send a good angel to save Israel. Then Maccabeus himself, first taking his arms, exhorted the rest to expose themselves together with him to the danger and to succor their brethren. And when they were going forth together with a willing mind, there appeared at Jerusalem a horseman going before them in white clothing, with golden armor shaking a spear. Then they all together blessed the merciful Lord and took great courage, being ready to break through not only men, but also the fiercest beasts and walls of iron. So they went on courageously, having a helper from heaven, and a Lord who showed mercy to them, and rushing violently upon the enemy like lions, they slew with them 11,000 footmen and 1,600 horsemen. See also 2 Maccabees chapter 8. How else can Samson kill a thousand people with the jawbone of an ass? Yeah. You tell me that. Yeah. But he did. Yeah. Me now even. If God wants me, you uh, uh, have to give me some big lung power. <laughs> but more than lung power, he's got to give you like... Yeah. I mean, come on. I mean, the guy was strong. Sam, watch the Samson movie. It's a good, great movie. Uh, the movie only shows him killing a few people. Though. In the reality, you read the Bible, he killed a thousand people yeah. himself. Yeah. And he drank out of the, out of the yeah. jawbone. And he got bing, 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 bing. That's God. God's got to go before you. And, and, and like in greater glory. We fire the bullets, but God determines where they yeah, land. Yeah. Because we are now an army. We are an army fighting for God. And for the church for absolute freedom. We must work together, me and you. We might die together, me and you. But we will fight with honor and dignity. And with cunning and by the grace of God we will be victorious viva Cristo Rey Today we are going to send a message. We are going to send a message to Caius and to the rest of the world. That freedom is not just for writers and for politicians and, and for fancy documents. Freedom. Freedom is our home, our wives, our children, our faith. Freedom is our lives. And we will defend it or die trying. It is not only our duty to defend it, but it is our right. You must remember that men will fire bullets, but God decides where they land. Que viva Cristo Rey! Que viva! Que viva You don't have to be a good shooter. You, you still want to try to be a good shooter. No. But if you happen to be not a good shooter, God will guide it. You don't want to do like my cousin Vinny when I got one on the front lawn. He's trying to shoot the arrow. He goes, bang, 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 bang. Oh. What is that?
So God is with us no matter what. And even if you die, you die tomorrow. Like during the Crusades, if you were, you go to confession. And if you were in a state of grace, because you'd go to confession, of course, before a battle. And if you died in a crusade and you went to confession and you're in a state of grace, you're a martyr. You go straight to heaven. Yeah. And they knew that. Mm -hmm. Come on. It's a ticket to heaven. Yeah. Or you can live the rest of your life and you might belong to mortal sin. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you can go back to France. You can go back to England. So, you got to die some way. And the thing is, when you have pagans being courageous for their pagan religion... And they are. Even witches and warlocks, they, they fight for their religions. How could it be that Christians are not courageous? When we have the, the true God behind us. Yeah. Because so many wimpy people in the world today, though. So that, that those are we told the heresies of uh, lack of just wars. They condemn any just wars. They, you know what's amazing? This poop in, this, this, this poop in Rome. What's his name? Francis the Bassahan Poop. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, all wars are evil. Do you hear him talk about Gaza? Really? No, no, exactly. Really? No. Is he saying anything? No. Is he opening his fat trap? Exactly. With all his power to stop it? No. Oh, the, the Jews can do it. The apostate Jews yeah. who deny Christ. They can have an army and they can kill people indiscriminately. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? But not Catholics? Yeah. Yeah, he just, you see, God is just. Yeah. Now, that guy's a Freemason or a Jew, so he's on the inside. But not everybody. The useful idiots are going to really be saying They deserve what they're going to get. When the Russians and the Chinese go in there and bulldoze over Europe and, and the Vatican, I'm going to dance on the roof when they do it. They're going to deserve every bit of it. When he was talking about the wall, too, remember? He's contending yeah, that we're yeah. building a wall. Yeah. Then they say, wait, you've got a wall around the back. <laughs> you can't have walls keep out people. Yeah. Then, oh, let people in. Oh, okay, why don't you let about a couple exactly. thousand Muslims into the Vatican yeah, City? Right. He let one family in, yeah. and he broadcast it all over TV. Oh, look it, we let this one Muslim family come in. He didn't tell you, lock them in the basement when the towers were no. He would let them in, though, and no, not lock them in the basement, either. Yeah, no. But why don't you let more in, you understand? Yeah. What a lying, filthy, Freemasonic, or apostate Jew bastard. I'll tell you something, the hierarchies of these apostates, every one of them, highly respect a Freemasonry or apostate Jew. You can't be as bad as they are, no. unless, like, when we talked about for greater glory. How could they have not defend it, the Custeros back yeah. then? Pius XI, yeah. that bastard. Yes. He let them, hung them out to dry, and sold them out. Sold them out! Do no. you want to follow these guys? <laughs> Boy, his brother Augustine online, he posted a great thing about Pius XII and how he See died. That. After yeah. he died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was, I couldn't believe it. I know. Mateo, I, Mateo says, is that true? <laughs> I even said, come on, what happened? Now, I know, uh, by the way, that this is good because what uh, brother Augustine came up with because it's just a testimony. Yeah. But before he died, remember, wasn't there something, they tell you that about before Pius XII died on his deathbed, yeah. he had this big darkness and all kinds, like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. like Alphonsus too. Yeah, he's so worried he, he was going to go to hell. Yeah. He, said, he, uh, he says, I'm going to go to hell. I see myself going to hell. This was on his deathbed. Yeah. So he had these portents of him going to hell mm -hmm. and it's re recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Now look at him after he died. Yeah. After he died. It's disgusting. Yeah. I'm quoting from an article titled Decomposition, the Enemy of Anatomy and Embalming in the Case of the Exploding Pope. The section called the Exploding Pope. When embalming goes wrong, it shows the power for production of gases during decomposition. In a very famous case, this occurred with anti, I'm saying uh, the anti here, anti Pope Pius XII died in Rome on October 11th, 1958. As is normally the case with popes, there was a, to be a large funeral with viewing, requiring the body to be embalmed to be preserved, to preserve it during the viewing process. In accordance with tradition, the papal physician Ricardo Giselli Lisi was responsible for the embalming. Known to be inco an incompetent physician, Galisi Lisi showed himself to be as bad at embalming as he was in normal medical matters, and he botched the embalming. He used a technique that involved soaking the body with oils, then wrapping it tightly in cellophane sheets. Although it was in line with Pius' wishes to be buried as God had made him, you may spot the mistake in that the internal organs were not preserved in this approach. Inevitably, autolysis 
plus putrefaction caused by the gut bacteria were soon generating large amounts of gas inside the body. This was exasperated by the failure to refrigerate the body in the unseasonable hot weather. Over the four-day course of the viewing and funeral ceremony, the Pope's chest exploded due to build, built up buildup of gases in the chest cavity. Then his nose and fingers fell off and the body turned a greenish black color. The smell was so sickening that some guards fainted and guarding, guarding can only be made bearable by changing the guard every 15 minutes. Galazi Lisi was humiliated and was eventually banned from the Vatican forever. And the part, after I read it, I said, you know what's more disgusting? You let his body stay here. The guards had to go on guard for 15 minutes. Get rid of this. Go. And he explodes. His fingers fell off. His nose fell off. His pen came off. His chest blew up. The stink came out of him. He turned blue and green. Oh, man, I never, that's great. And the guy who bombed him was a... Uh, yeah. botched it. Botched it. Yeah. That's great stuff, isn't yeah. it? I mean, when that happens, I mean, and they, but the worst part is they let the guy stay there yeah. instead yeah. of burying him right away. Yeah. And what? You can, what? How are people going to go in to look at that? Yeah. What, are you going to put a gas mask on? <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a, a rotten human corpse is oh, nasty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is, uh, if you ever smelt one, you know, like... Uh, but uh, my friends are the cops, too, you know, they, they, but the rotten one, he went, one of my friends, they get holy... They went to a building where there's a couple of dead people. They're dead for a couple of days. Yeah. And he went, wow. And the whole body bloated up yeah. and, oh, what a stink. They put like Vicks Vapor Rub under their nose. Yeah. It's just sort of like eradicate some of them. But uh, you, one of the things you talk about military guys during the war in Japan, when they were fighting, the Marines were fighting in Japan, yeah. the dead bodies were stacked up and they were using them even yeah. like bunkers. And the dead bodies were just, and the bodies were rotting. Yeah. So not only now are... You know, we got great. We got um, band of brothers. You can yeah. like that, mm -hmm. and you would like also. I, I love soldiers, guys. Right. I don't care. You slide down also, the you know, even if they're not Catholic, I, I yeah. admire soldiers for what, in the sense of for what they sacrifice. Yeah. Even on the Japan side, which uh, Clint Eastwood gave a thing on the Japanese on. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what was Yeah, yeah. 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 that's a good one too. He showed uh, uh, from the Japanese perspective fighting the Marines, but and the war in the Pacific. That's a great story too, but. Uh, it's it's bad enough that you're over there fighting. It's, I mean, fighting is fighting, but you got to smell these stinking rotten corpses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean. Yeah. Wow. Heard a part in the Band of Brothers when he slides down the hill into the dead body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah. That's why I say soldiers are more convertible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of the things they go through. Yeah. Obedience to authority, sacrifice, and when uh, and they have to do all these exercises, they have to sacrifice. I wonder over there, a lot of times uh, they're, they're, uh, they got to eat their food. They hardly have enough food. They're in a trench. It's raining. It's cold. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that hardens them and prepares them for conversion. Whereas you got some wimpy, sappy people living in the suburbs that don't even believe in stepping on an ant <laughs> or never have to suffer anything, and they don't want to make sacrifices. And they don't obey anybody. That's a big thing, too. Obedience. <clears throat> <laughs> now tomorrow's a feast of Purim, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. great feast day, and uh, I recommend to watch to watch Esther. You know, mm -hmm. either tonight or tomorrow night. But we're going to watch it tomorrow night. What a great movie there is, Queen Esther and Mordecai. They're in heaven right now. They're Catholics. They paved the way for us. The unfaithful Jews have no right to her nor to him. Oh, they go around on Purim and they're Purim, but that's bullshit. Yeah. Remember our Lord said, if, if you didn't believe in Moses, John 5, 4, you would believe in me. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, do not, if you don't believe in his writings, how will you believe in me? John 5, 44, 45. He told those Jews, you don't really believe in Moses because you don't believe in me. You don't really believe in Queen Esther and Mordecai because you don't believe in yeah. Christ. Yeah. Exactly. Because they paved the road for Christ. There are people, not your people. <laughs> Purine belongs to us, not you. And I don't want to go into another lecture on this. I get so angry at this because... Uh, <laughs> It belongs to us. Yeah. We let these bastards take possession of the Old Testament ritual festivals and like it belongs to them. It doesn't. Yeah. When they celebrate Passover, Purim, uh, Rosh Hashanah, it don't belong to them. Mm -hmm. It belongs to us. Yeah. That's what they told Mel. He has no right to do to Maccabees. Maccabees belongs to us Jews. No, it belongs to us Catholics. It don't belong to you. Uh, yeah. 
You believe in a false Maccabee, a false Moses, a yeah, false yeah. Queen Esther. Yeah. But it's a great movie anyway. So I would re recommend that if anybody... On, on tomorrow. I think this is the first year we're going to be doing Purim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat>